I'm Sapi Ghazaryan. I'm director of the Institute of Armenian Studies here at USC. Thank you very much for coming. This is the fourth luncheon talk that we've done this year, and because we grab the guests as we can, we've had to switch venues, and by next year, I suspect we will have found a permanent home, but we kind of really like this one, so I'm glad you're all here. Please help yourselves to lunch. Um, you know, these couple of days talking about East Coast and blizzards and all of that, and we all kind of realize how lucky we are to be in California, but it occurs to me that uh, in this context, we also take something else for granted, and that is that the breadth and scope of history that there is here in California is incredible, political, economic, social, and we're very lucky that today here in conversation with Professor Hovanesian, we have the chair of the history department and the director, the founding director of the Institute for California and the West, which is a center that's in partnership with the Huntington Libraries. The founding director is Professor Bill Deverell, and we're very happy that he is here because uh, today, our guest, Professor Richard Hovanesian, who is new to the SC campus, um, a uh, chalk up one for the Trojans in this case because we've kind of brought him over on, from the other side of the freeway. Uh, and uh, Professor Hovanestian, whom many of you have heard and read, usually speaks about the Republic of Armenia, which is what his many volumes have been about, and about genocide and its consequences. Today we've asked him to speak about himself, uh, and we've called this talk the half-immigrant because although he was born here, he is uh, the son of parents and of a community that were very much immigrants in the San Joaquin Valley. And I think that uh, we really are going to learn a lot about the interaction between immigrants in California. Thank you, both of you, and please uh, enjoy the conversation. It is being live streamed, so you'll be able to catch it up on the web later, too. Can you hear me okay? So uh, I'm Bill Deverell from the History Department. It's a real pleasure to be here, to be asked by my friends and colleagues to engage in this conversation with Professor Hovhannisian, um, a distinguished man of letters and a global citizen of politics and culture and history. Uh, it's really a pleasure to sit here with you, Richard. You. So my, uh, my task today is to um, have a series of questions and small conversations with our guest about this notion of half-immigrant status, about the depth of California history, which is a, uh, a region, of course, that is woven uh, inextricably with immigrant status. Uh, it's something that we historians of California constantly encounter. Every story, every individual life is different, and yet there are some themes that are perhaps common. And so it should be a really lively and interesting conversation. I think one way to start is th this, this conversation with uh, Professor Hovhannisian is going to draw on his own life experiences and uh, ways in which his own life and his trajectory through California and the California past has influenced his work uh, and his uh, ideas. But let's just start off just very briefly, Richard, if you don't mind. Tell us um, the, the um, straightforward issues of biography for you. Yes, well, um, as you noted, uh, I, was, I was born in Tulare, California, a small um, farming community uh, not far from Fresno, an hour, at, at those days probably an hour and a half drive from Fresno. Uh, my father had been through the uh, genocide of 1915, had uh, survived uh, by, uh, by chance, by, because when they, during the forced marches when they took all his village people, um, almost all of them never to be seen again on the death marches toward the desert. He was a preteen, uh, probably around uh, 13 years old, and uh, was a strapling young boy. The Kurdish tribesmen spotted him and uh, took him away from his uh, pregnant mother and two-year-old brother, who went on to die, uh, took him away to um, act as a shepherd, free labor, uh, lived uh, meagerly uh, on scraps until he could run away in 1917 to uh, where the Russian and Armenian volunteers had come in eastern um, Anatolia or Turkey and then got caught up in the Russian Civil War between Reds and Whites and uh, at the age of uh, 19 arrived um, 
in, on the east coast of uh, the United States to work in the sweatshops of New England, and then to come to California to try to start a new life, as he did. Uh, and, you know, I think about that, and he did this, uh, had been through all of this, uh, death, destruction, uh, relocation, uh, and so forth, all uh, by the time that normal American kids uh, graduating from high school. So um, I, I uh, grew up in uh, this immigrant household um, where uh, there was um, really a divide between the world of my home, the house, and the world outside uh, of school. And uh, as immigrants, and I expect all immigrant children, um, the challenge was to navigate between the house, the home, and the immigrant culture and ways and mores, and that of the Anglo, um, idealized Anglo society to which we aspired to become accepted and be a part of. Uh, and. Um, that did cause identity problems, and I expect a lot of immigrant children have identity problems as to who are we and uh, what, um, uh, what do we want to become. So let's just go back just for a second to this incredible odyssey of your father's. Why uh, from uh, New England in the Mid-Atlantic to the Central Valley of California? The, um, uh, the first instance is he did have a relative in California, um, in Tulare where uh, there were about uh, 10 or 12 Armenian families in the whole town, all, all from the same village, all from his village, of, of men who had come before the genocide and therefore were, were here. And probably his uncle uh, encouraged him to travel. Uh, you know, it was um, the, um, I think the uh, ambitious uh, Armenian immigrants who came to California because it was a, uh, probably a five-day train journey to go across the country. It was, uh, no, it's not a five-hour flight uh, about which we complain, but five days. Uh, but, but those um, immigrants came to the Central Valley, and because it was very much like their home, uh, most Armenians in historic Armenia were uh, peasant farmers. And uh, when they became immigrants in the United States, the vast majority of Armenians were required to change their lifestyle and become factory workers, textile mills of New England and wire factory in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, and tractor factories in Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, uh, so they changed their lifestyle entirely they, uh, to finding jobs in places where they didn't have to have fluent English to work. And it was those brave ones who came to California. And only in California did they continue, really, the um, agrarian uh, lifestyle that they had in their, their homeland. And so my father, uh, as soon as he could, um, took advantage, I suppose, of the uh, Depression years. And Armenians are frugal. He had worked hard and probably had saved up uh, a couple of thousand dollars with which he could buy uh, an 18-acre uh, farm. And uh, then, as other immigrants, uh, he worked his children mercil mercilessly uh, day and night on the farm because it was a family, uh, family venture. So it almost goes without saying that when you study immigrants in California, invariably, regardless of where they come from on the globe, they find places in California that look like or feel like home because California's landscape and geography is so astonishingly diverse. So we do encounter folks from global diasporas who end up along the coast or in the Sierras or in the Central Valley or in the cities because it feels like home. And it sounds like that was your father's experience. That was, uh, for those who came to the San Joaquin Valley, that was their experience. Uh, and uh, it, it gave them also um, a different perspective, I think, a sense of independence, even though uh, some of them were, had heavily uh, mortgaged their farms to the banks and lost them during the Depression, and then the washouts came to Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, uh, but because they're overall they were frugal, um, uh, uh, they could take advantage of the fact that so many of the other farms had been foreclosed during the Depression, and with a relatively small amount of money were able to... Uh, gain their, um, uh, something that they owned. And so the sense of um, 
independence, economic independence, was very important. And even those immigrants who uh, came to the East Coast and Midwest, a lot of them went into uh, small uh, shops such as tailoring and mom and pop groceries and uh, professions of that kind, where even though they were meager uh, income, nonetheless, they were their own boss. You've given us a new way to think about the half-immigrant description here with the, the binary between home and that which exists outside of the home, so the immigrant home community, the literal home, and then the community outside. Before we delve into that, let's talk a little bit more about the Depression. When, when we teach California history and we teach to Larry and Kern County and Fresno, et cetera, we invariably encounter the Grapes of Wrath. Um, we invariably encounter uh, the film or the novel, which tends in its uh, depiction of ethnic communities, tends to focus largely on the Oklahoma, Arkansas Dust Bowl migrants of American stock uh, moving across the country in hopes and desperation to California and encountering with the occasional nod to Mexican or Mexican-American workers in that story, encountering largely white American stock who are the growers or the policemen, et cetera. So growing up in exactly that place at exactly that time, tell us a little bit about the ethnic and immigrant diversity that you encountered as a kid that's distinct from this kind of binary notion of the Dust Bowl migrants. Well, I'm not entirely independent of that um, picture because uh, when I went to elementary school in Tulare, uh, many of my classmates were people who were referred to as Okies. Uh, these were the migrants from uh, the Dust Bowls. And uh, I remember going to school with them uh, when they were barefooted. They came to school without shoes. And I went, of course, all summer in the farm without shoes. That was not uh, uh, exceptional because we, we developed these real tough soles out on the hot sand and dirt. Uh, but uh, it, I did wear shoes to school. Uh, and the, uh, my not wearing shoes was a matter of choice. Their not wearing shoes was a matter of necessity. Um, and uh, it, it was um, in, in this half immigrant world, there were different other kinds of immigrants because the fact that my father was a farmer, the fact that he did have a farm, meant that he employed other immigrants when it came to harvest time. And so well, we had the transient um, Mexican uh, grape pickers who would come, uh, perhaps even live on your property uh, in tents or, or, or little outhouses, if you had little uh, external houses, uh, may live there for five days or seven days with their children. Uh, and then they would move on to the next farm and to the next town. And so those little children really had no opportunity for a continuous education. And, and that went on for, uh, for a number of years uh, uh, in my lifetime. Uh, so here we have uh, myself being a half immigrant, but also others who seemed to be sort of full immigrants in the sense that they had no uh, opportunity for acculturation adjustment as we did in my other half of my world where I could be a part of the Anglo society and go to a Baptist church and uh, cheer at football games and basketball games. And, and uh, you know, even though I had the long last name, um, my classmates quickly found uh, a short name to it, and so I, for everyone, I was not Hovenisian. I was Hovi, and I became Hovi to the entire school. Amazing. So um, the cultural um, attractions to the Anglo community or cultural participation in the Anglo community, church, sports, hanging out with your friends, high school activities, etc. On the Armenian side, growing up, tell us about the Armenian cultural um, institutions and or activities that you were involved in as a yeah. kid. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Even though I have this, I, I did have an identity crisis and I aspired to be accepted by the non-Armian world, I didn't reject uh, m my own um, culture uh, to the degree that I understood it. And it was very rich in the sense of um, hospitality of uh, the Armenian families visiting one another. It was a a uh, time when um, people uh, did things as families. You've, you didn't have a telephone, so you got in the car and you went to 
the first Armenian neighbor's house, and if they weren't home, you go to the next one until you find someone there, and they're very happy to, to receive you, and you take some fruit or something from your garden, and, it's, uh, and then there is this sort of ritual in which the men sort of segregate uh, into the uh, screened uh, porches to play cards or chat or backgammon, and the women sit in the parlors chatting, and, and the children, who knows where they are, in between a, a different world. Uh, my, our, our house was uh, so open, not, not also literally open, because we went to bed without shutting our doors. I mean, there was no locks on our doors uh, on the farm. The screen door was open, and people could come and go. Um, but uh, our home was, my father's home was such that he built a special table that uh, would seat about 40 people, and they would, we could bring it, carry it into the house with portable legs and set it up in this long, old dining room that we had for guests to come. And the guests that came were not only people we knew, they were people we didn't know. Uh, because they knew from, they were visiting from Boston, and they, someone said, oh, you know, there's this family there, you can go and visit them. And they would come and stay with us for two or three days, people we didn't even uh, know. So there was this um, kind of thing. The women, uh, I, I sort of hang up, uh, hung out with women more than the men. They were more interesting to me. Uh, and and they, um, they, they gossiped a lot, they told stories. And, uh, and among the stories they told were their uh, stories of their deportation. That was not the main theme of their discussions, but it was always there as an undercurrent. Uh, they had been through uh, uh, unspeakable um, atrocities. And uh, it was really frightening for me uh, as a youngster to look at some of these women because they had been taken into uh, Bedouin uh, tribes and those Bedouin tribes uh, tattooed their women in a particular style so they would be recognized. And some of the women I grew up with had these curlicues, these uh, medallions all over their faces, and their lips were entirely blue. And it was really sort of scary, and there was no means for them to remove it. It was a time when tattooing was not in for women, and uh, also there was no way of, of removing it. It was a, also a, a mark of the fact uh, that they had been uh, taken away and uh, were forced to live with people who they didn't choose to live with, and then it f were the fortunate ones in the sense that they had been rescued. They all had stories, and um, some, while the specific details were different, uh, the story, uh, the overall, the overarching story was the same for, for all of them. And as I say, we grew up with those people, and we, I heard those stories all the time, but I didn't internalize them to my knowledge, and I didn't really feel that that was my personal experience. I was aware it was that other half of uh, the immigrant that uh, experienced that, and I was, in a sense, um, well, sort of naively um, relieved, I suppose, that uh, my parents' generation had had such misfortunes that it allowed me to be born in America as an American, and I didn't want to be anything else but an American. I mean, I was that naive to, to think that way, and it took some years for me to realize the enormity of the calamity that had occurred. So was there in your head as a let's say a teenager, while you're still in the Central Valley, is there a dialogue you have with yourself about your identity as an American, as a Californian, as a resident of the Central Valley? Not a conscious dialogue. It was a, a lived dialogue and a compartmentalized existence. That is, in the home, uh, you're, you're used to uh, a certain way of uh, of doing things, um, uh, you accept the fact that you visit other immigrant families, that, um, that you go to Sunday, uh, these huge Sunday uh, outdoor picnics uh, at the Kings River, which is 20 miles away from Fresno, where uh, three or four or 5,000 Armenians from all over the San Joaquin Valley will gather, and you can hear the smell of kebab from about a mile away and the sounds of oriental Armenian music and dancing that is taking place at these um, outdoor Sunday uh, picnics where people from all over come to meet one another, um, uh, socialize and f get uh, some degree of um, comfort 
from, from meeting uh, one another. Uh, so that was all acceptable uh, uh, to me. Uh, but, uh, but my other world, my outside world, was, was more important to me. My Anglo world was more important to me. I, I aspired to be accepted there. I joined uh, various um, groups, uh, such as Junior Statesman, which was a sort of a social science or uh, un model United Nations kind of thing. I wasn't comfortable uh, being just uh, an ethnic. I remember very well, I, I spent two years in, at Fresno State uh, after I graduated from Tulare High School. And I was aware of the fact there is um, uh, very serious and strong prejudice against Armenians in Fresno to the degree that no <clears throat> Armenian graduate from Fresno State um, College, as it was known then, had any possibility to get a teaching job in the city of Fresno. Uh, the restrictions, if you even, uh, my parents later moved to Fresno and bought a uh, a, uh, a, a small piece of property for their house across from a golf course <coughs> that is known as Sunnyside Golf Course. And if you look at the deed, uh, there are prohibitions that this property cannot be sold to, uh, to Negroes, uh, to uh, Asians, Orientals, and Armenians. So there was this um, uh, uh, prohibitions on, on selling the very property where my parents uh, later were able to to move and live uh, their, their final years. Uh, and my insecurity was so much, I can remember now, about not wanting to be identified as a Fresno Armenian because uh, you know, I was something else. That when I first went into a class of English, the first year of English class at Fresno State, and my teacher saw my name and she said, you're Armenian. And I, I was sort of panicked. And I said, yes, but I'm not from Fresno. Uh, as if that was going to make you know, such a great difference that I'm an Armenian, but I'm not from Fresno, so don't judge me like you're judging the, the Fresno Armenians. Uh, so it shows the degree of insecurity uh, that I had as, as far as the ethnic half of me is concerned. Well, you anticipated a question I was going to ask, that until you went to college, the world you paint of family and identity and Kings River picnics and things, it sounds idyllic. So your parents and the elders in your life seem to have protected you from the harsher and uglier reflexes of ethnic and racial prejudice. Uh, yeah, we didn't hear, um, from my father we never heard about the genocide, even though he had been through all of these. I didn't learn about these details that I just told you about until uh, his uh, last couple of years of his life when he started to reflect. Uh, a part of the reason probably for the immigrant silence was that, um, well, maybe they were protecting us and didn't want us to suffer or to be traumatized by what they went through. But they probably also had the sense that nobody cares. Uh, that's the old world, they had been through this. Uh, these are, uh, you know, wh who's listening? That generation uh, neither had the, uh, the vocal, the verbal, or the literary skills to be able to, uh, for the most part, to be able to uh, transfer those senses and experiences onto a new generation, which I say, really, and I was not alone in that, we, um, and I think I was typical in that sense, that we, we didn't reject who we were, for the most part, but we didn't want to dwell upon it, and we wanted to be uh, much more of a part of the, of the, of, of the broader world. Um, that, that was uh, my experience. Uh, maybe they want, I mean, they, it wasn't an idyllic world, by the way. It was far from being an idyllic world. It was a world of hard work and labor. I mean, it was not only um, uh, uh, we who were, um, awakened at five o'clock in the morning to go out and sulfur uh, the vineyards because you have to sulfur before it, the sun comes up so the sulfur will stick on the grape leaves. But it was our neighbor Portuguese children as well who were being you know, ra uh, awakened by their parents to go out and milk the cows. The Portuguese all had uh, cattle herds in our uh, town. So again, uh, 
if these immigrant groups um, have become successful as they have, uh, I think it's, uh, as it may be with, with Koreans and others uh, today in, in Los Angeles, it's that uh, labor is not individual, it's collective labor. Uh, my mother uh, was a young girl when she came here, and she would work in fruit packing and fruit canneries, and, and all the kids, whatever they make, $5 or $10 a week, uh, that would go into the general kitty. And if you, that general kitty then gradually builds up uh, the where you can do something as, uh, as a collective unit. So you've referenced a couple times the power of the stories that you grew up in and around uh, that were shared with you, which is oftentimes we see that as an attraction in, in the life of people who end up with a scholarly career, or perhaps particularly for historians who are attracted to narrative and stories. Was there the you know, proverbial fork in the road where you might have stayed uh, as opposed to moving on towards the, uh, embracing the life of a scholar? Well. Um, I was always different in my family. Um, my, my brothers were um, much more like the typical American than I was uh, with uh, going out and, and, and doing things with, uh, you know, I was a fat, fat little kid and uh, wasn't so um, engaged with uh, sports. I, I watched them, but I didn't play them like my brothers did. Uh, and uh, so I was a little always different in the f sense that I was aware of history, even though I was not engaged directly uh, with the uh, experience. Uh, nonetheless, I was aware of uh, who I was to that degree. And I uh, always felt a, a sense of hurt um, when I would, uh, because I was, I was always interested in history. That just was there. I was pretty good in school. I don't know why, but I was. Uh, but I should also say, talking about being half immigrant, I didn't learn any um, American or English grammar until I went to high school and took Latin. And it's only then, when I was in high school as a freshman taking Latin, that I came to learn that the word whom, H-W-H-O-M, is not, as I had thought, the plural, plural word for who. Who, whom. I thought whom was plural. Uh, and so it shows, again, the half-immigrant who grows up with this sort of half-immigrant language, English language, all around you. Um, but um, the, the, the fact that I was um, academically inclined uh, meant that I would look in uh, geography and history uh, textbooks for the name Armenia in the index, and like many others, was disappointed that I didn't find the name there, or if I did, it was just in passing that the Romans conquered 15 countries, including Armenia, and that was the only reference to it was. And there were no postage stamps, there was no flag uh, in front of the United Nations. That was uh, s something of, of a hurt uh, for me. And uh, I, uh, that's not what determined my going into academics. I, I knew that I wanted to be a teacher from a very young age. That was, I, I, went, I, you know, I did directly what I wanted to do. I went on to uh, Berkeley and, and got my secondary teaching uh, degree, as I had always planned to do. But I didn't think, I didn't have enough confidence to think that I could go on to a, to a doctoral degree. That took uh, a little more um, work. And also, uh, by that time, by the time I had uh, gone to Berkeley, I had uh, then uh, felt uh, a rediscovery uh, of my Armenian identity. I was comfortable being a non-Armenian, but now that had allowed me to become comfortable as being an Armenian. And I became uh, active in Armenian youth organizations, a leadership role in Armenian youth organizations, and prompted me to want to learn the Armenian language, which I could only speak Kitchen Armenian, dialectical Kitchen Armenian, and uh, propelled me to go on to Beirut, um, Lebanon, for a year to learn Armenian. You couldn't go to Armenia at the time. It was a Soviet country and not open to Western 
uh, uh, youth, and so Beirut was the most important Armenian center in the world at the time, and by living in an Armenian environment and learning that Armenia was not just in language for immigrants, but a, a language for children, as I discovered in, in Beirut. It gave me the means to come back uh, and to go back to Berkeley for an MA degree and then a PhD degree at UCLA with uh, having the ability to use Armenian and Armenian sources uh, that are essential to do what I wanted to do, and that was to write a history of the first Armenian Re Republic, which existed only three years, uh, from 1918 to 1920, 1921, before it was swallowed up by Soviet Russia and uh, uh, Turkey. Uh, and I spent uh, many years uh, working on that as, uh, uh, as a result of this sort of reawakening of my uh, identity. How old were you when you spent the year in Beirut? Uh, I, I graduated with a secondary credential. I went um, as a 22-year-old. And the uh, first couple of weeks, I sat with six-year-olds learning um, uh, poetry, not poetry, ri uh, uh, sort of nursery rhymes uh, with the children, you know, Sevugulik, Sirunulik, Urgertas, Saresa, or something like that. Uh, and then I, I decided that was not for me. So I, uh, what I did was take advantage of the Armenian environment and to sit down and to work 14 hours a day intensely by myself, making up uh, flashcards for vocabulary I didn't know, and on every page there were probably a hundred words I didn't know. And I also discovered that probably 10% of the words I did know, uh, that I had known before, were actually not Armenian at all, they were Turkish or Arabic uh, or some other language, and that I had to learn the Armenian terminology for these words. I forget the uh, regional dialect that I had uh, picked up a little bit of, and. Uh, learn so-called um, standard Western Armenian. Uh, and so I did this all as, a, as an adult, and I was uh, really an anomaly for many reasons. The first, because I, I also taught English uh, when I went to, uh, to the school there. And when I walked in the first day, I picked up the chalk, and I went to the chalkboard to write something, and I lifted my left hand to write with my left hand, and the whole class of 30 youngsters gasped because I was writing, I was a left, they hadn't, I was writing with my left hand and nobody wrote with their left hand in Beirut in the 1950s because their parents, if they were left-handed, would tie their hands down, would do everything so they wouldn't be left-handed and hear this guy coming in, strange American coming in and writing with his left hand. In any case, it was a very uh, rich and rewarding year and was very important in my going on to become an academic, which I didn't dream that I could become, that is, I wanted to be a teacher, but I didn't think that I had the skills uh, and ability to uh, go on into the higher education system, and uh, let alone to write books. And writing has never been easy for me. I've, uh, I, uh, it, it's very labor intensive. Uh, I have to uh, work uh, up four or five drafts. When I wrote, write my volumes on the history of the Republic of Armenia, every volume that I started out with was 3,000 pages. And so I had to then work so hard to make 3,000 pages into 300 pages, and that is wow. a big wow. job. So I think I know the answer to this with your story of the left-handedness, but as you go to Beirut as a young man, your formerly half-immigrant status, which could stand out, in the Central Valley must have fallen away, and you were an American in the eyes of those over there. Yes, uh, we, we were even called the Americans. Um, and uh, we, we were the Americans, yeah, but, but there was also a uh, sort of um, warm and benign, uh, not benign, I would say uh, accepting, uh, acceptingness of, uh, of these Americans with their strange uh, ways, even uh, a degree of uh, admiration. Uh, I, as I said, I taught English, and at the end of the uh, school year, uh, I liked my students so much, and they liked me so much, that we rented a little bus and went out to uh, Nahar Kelp, which is a river out in the, um, uh, in the mountains. You know, no teachers had ever done that ever before, to go on a field trip 
uh, uh, or a picnic with their students. And so, you know, this was the, the Western way of, of doing things. And, and by the way, since I'm now talking about this, I hope you will all get this book when you leave, uh, Family of Shadows, which is written by my grandson, and which is my, the story of my father, and then the story of me, the half-immigrant, uh, who was very uncomfortable, and uh, it's important for identity, and then my, my children's generation, who are very comfortable in being Armenian and even looking to go back to an Armenia, rather, whether it's imagined or real or Armenian. So it's the Armenian saga, and probably if you are Armenian, it's your story as well. So I hope you'll, that, that will help you along. Yeah. So in a moment here, we'll turn to you all for questions and comments for our guests. But um, spending time and chatting with my colleague Richard Antaramian in the back there has taught me as a California historian I think I knew this, but not nearly as much as I ought to, about the, the just sheer complexity of what people like myself naively refer to as the Armenian community. And so your story about Fresno, as distinct from Tulare, prompts this question. How can you help us, those of us that are not steeped in Armenian history and culture the way you or Richard are, how can you help us understand the differences in California of various Armenian communities and diasporic histories? Well, I would tell you um, to look at the Hispanic world, where you have Guatemalans, Salvadorians, Mexicans, uh, and others who, to the outside world, all look the same, but internally are very different, uh, culturally and otherwise. And uh, you have to look at the Armenian community in the same way as having many subcultures coming from many different culture, uh, countries, having been, uh, for, for some of them, having been uprooted for the fourth time in their life. I mean, th that generation is virtually gone. But these were people, uh, many of whom ended up in Los Angeles, who were born in the Ottoman Empire, grew up as youngsters in the Arab Middle East, where they were, the Arabs accepted the Armenians very well and very generously. Uh, but because of their nationalism and Armenian, imagined Armenia, when Soviet Armenia, after World War II, opened the doors for um, repatriation or immigration, many of these people left uh, Beirut and Aleppo and Cairo and other cities and went to Yerevan or other parts of what was Soviet Armenia. So that was a third existence. And then finally, in the later years of the Soviet Union, or after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they left again because of uh, political or economic reasons and ended up here in Southern California. So they've had four, four different lifetimes in one lifetime. And one needs to understand that. One also under, one needs to understand uh, in uh, Southern California there's the largest concentration of Armenians who were born in what was Soviet Armenia uh, in the United States. And they've come from a very different cultural, political background. Uh, they've had to... Um, survive by um, means that uh, sometimes are not regarded as being very ethical in, uh, in our society, perhaps. But that was necessary for them to, um, to survive there. Uh, the, the problem is, if they try to survive the same way here, it's not going to work. And there are issues that, um, uh, that arise. So many different um, subcultures uh, and a, a richness, a richness of them. As we close, can you tell us a little bit about what brought you to USC to join our wider scholarly and student yeah, uh, community? Yes. <laughs> After a, a half century rooting for UCLA, uh, I was um, approached by uh, the dean here, uh, Dean Kay and others, and was sort of recruited to uh, come to USC to work with the Shoah Foundation. Um, it has received a significant uh, collection of survivor, Armenian survivor testimony from the Armenian Film Foundation that was headed by J. Michael Hagopian. Uh, there are some 400 interviews, some very short, some very long, some very good, some very bad. Uh, and uh, we are now uh, at the Shoah Foundation in the process of um, uh, preparing these for uh, indexing, translation, transcription, translation, indexing, and then finally putting them on the uh, web for um, 
uh, use for scholarly purposes. And it's been a, a challenge, and uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, and already I think we have two or three up on the web as a sample, and there will be by April 24th, which is the 100th anniversary, hopefully 50 of these will be prepared for use for the, by the general public. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you, Professor Hovhannisian, members of your family who've joined us. It's been a lovely and lively conversation. I really appreciate it. Thanks to all of you. Let's give Professor Hovhannisian a round of applause. And then I think uh, if there are questions or comments in the audience, if you could uh, raise your hand, I can probably see you through the light and you can uh, pose your question. Yes, right over here. If you can, then, sorry, we're recording. Do you so want me to repeat can, it? If we're recording, so if you can, please come oh, up to the mic. Great, yeah, why don't you all come up to the mic as you have questions so it gets on the recording, thanks. I was intrigued by your presentation. Um, I myself am a half immigrant Hungarian, um, came to this country when I was six. And a lot of what you described resonated and rings true of my experience, although very different world, but my parents are Holocaust survivors. So same thing, growing up in a very uh, comfortable, safe world uh, in, from a family that had been through trauma. And uh, I wonder, it, being myself middle-aged now, and I have my children, and I married an American, an American Jew, but not an immigrant, and, uh, and my children, I've not been able to transmit any of my culture to my children or my language, and, um, or even really any strong sense of Jewish identity, and I wonder if you could address that, of how the Armenian community manages to transmit that in a way that other immigrant communities don't. Uh, I, I wouldn't generalize entirely. Um, the Armenians perhaps do transmit more than other groups because of the denial of the Armenian genocide because there was never any kind of, uh, I wouldn't even call it closure, uh, uh, sense of recompense, either moral or political or economic, uh, and so that lives. But it doesn't mean that all children of, uh, or grandchildren of survivors of the Armenian Genocide are really engaged. I, I, because I am closer to Fresno uh, in many ways than I am to Los Angeles, although I've lived here for many, most of my life, uh, I can see that third generation, fourth generation, uh, Armenian Americans um, don't have that. Uh, sense of uh, necessity, need, of uh, remembrance. Uh, they're happy being Armenian. Uh, they like Armenian food. Uh, they like Armenian dance. But it doesn't mean that they're going to go out and demonstrate uh, on any occasion. Um, and so in that way, Arme uh, Los Angeles is, um, and some of the cities of the United States are uh, different in that they're uh, much more a recent immigrant, and therefore the transmission has been stronger for a people coming from an Armenian-speaking background or an Armenian-speaking um, culture than those who have uh, not. Uh, there is um, uh, a growing number in all of these countries, whether it's our, uh, United States, France, or Argentina, who, uh, who are like uh, Rafi in this book, who, um, well, not even like Rafi, uh, beyond Rafi, who don't speak any of the, their native language except perhaps 10 words. Whether, but their language is English and their language is French and their language is Spanish. But their hearts become strongly Armenian and become more engaged in uh, Armenian cause than someone who's a very fluent in Armenian can read and write Armenian, but is not necessarily engaged. So we have a, a sort of a transition uh, that is going on in these uh, societies. And perhaps, um, uh, perhaps it's important to have an elite, sort of a political and cultural elite in each of these countries that will uh, perpetuate this. Other questions or comments, if you could come to the mic. And if anyone would like to do that, I, as, as, as someone may come forward, I have a quick question. Go ahead. No, go right ahead, Salvi. 
do you um, transmit, give messages to, talk with your grandchildren in a way different from the way you did with your children regarding life, biography, history, and all of that? I tend not to speak to my grandchildren. Uh, and so I'm not a good transmitter. They're too close to me. I can transmit to others, to my UCLA students for a half century. But it comes down to immediate family. Uh, it's through osmosis rather than direct uh, penetration. That makes sense? It's osmosis. So in Southern California, are we seeing over the last couple of decades or so uh, more and more things named in the public uh, landscape uh, for Armenian figures and Armenian no moments of history? Schools, yeah. streets, parks. What do you think? Yes? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I, yes, that's happening. Uh, uh, there is a higher consciousness today of uh, Armenianness and Armenia than there was certainly when I began my academic career. Uh, by 1945 uh, or 41, even with the, or 39, with the beginning of World War II, the Armenian genocide, for example, had become what uh, virtually is called a forgotten genocide. That is, within one generation, uh, it was no longer an issue. It had been abandoned by the world had been swept under the cart carton, uh, c carpet by all the great powers that made so many promises and pledges about restitution and rehabilitation of the Armenian people that were never uh, carried out, and therefore it's better to have amnesia than to remember. And uh, the, the Armenians did not. The my parents' generation, uh, were, who were directly affected, did not have what is referred to as a, a large megaphone. Uh, they had a little paper uh, megaphone that no one heard. They, uh, and so they d could not make their voices heard. And so it had to be my generation, their children's generation, that was, uh, took up the uh, obligation, if you want to call it the burden, to become their voice and to propagate their experience and the lessons to be gained from it. And so today, Today, uh, even though we are at the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, uh, I can say that uh, we have, there is much more consciousness today, probably in the, in the educated public at least, uh, than there was 40 years ago. And there have been, when I started um, my academic career, there were probably no more than 10 reliable books on Armenian history and culture in English language. Now there are hundreds of them. And so um, you know, there is this advancement that takes place. It does not, the issues are not solved. Uh, the pressures of denial uh, will uh, continue and are continuing. And I find it very um, typical and painful that on the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, on April 24th of this year, the Turkish government, uh, instead of acknowledging, instead of participating, is trying to cover it up by moving the date to the commemoration of this international memorial of Gallipoli, the campaign where the British and French, uh, I'm sorry, the British and Canadians and Australians and New Zealanders landed on the Gallipoli uh, Peninsula in Turkey. They have moved this uh, uh, Armenian Memorial Day uh, to their Gallipoli Day, to Armenian Memorial Day, and inviting world leaders, and my understanding is that large numbers of them, including the prime ministers of New Zealand and Australia, possibly Prince Charles and William, will be in attendance with other world leaders as a means uh, of uh, continuing the denial, which can also only increase uh, and maintain the trauma uh, and make it maybe indirectly a way that it becomes more transmitted that would, than it would be in your case as a survivor, uh, a child of a survivor of the Holocaust, which has been fully acknowledged and for which uh, compensation is still being made. Hello. Um, as someone very much mired ensconced or trapped occasionally in the 
Armenian American experience in Los Angeles uh, with parents from Iran. And as a former student of yours, I was wondering if you could perhaps speak to not just the, the difficulty in communication like between the, the home and the outside world, when, when you were saying like, for example, we become the face of the community, but even between the generations, like if there's any, any thoughts you have about the difficulty in communication between parents and children, for example. <laughs> well, there have always been difficulties between parents and, and, and uh, you know, fathers and sons, uh, name of a famous novel, uh, a Russian novel. Uh, there, there have always been these difficulties of fathers and sons. In the Armenian organized world, um, it's a serious issue. It's a serious issue. Um, fathers want to have a great deal of compliance from the sons. I do too, and as a person. Uh, I want compliance and obedience. But that has um, uh, a real danger to it in that it creates such uh, constriction and strictures that it does not encourage um, investigation and in doing and finding new ways of approaching issues. Uh, we are comfortable with the old way of doing things, the tried and tested ways of doing things, without taking uh, note of the fact that the world has changed, uh, the ways of doing things are being, have changed, uh, mores have changed, and uh, to be able to not feel threatened by change or by innovation, as we frequently are, as the older generation, uh, trying to put limits on exploration, investigation, and considering this to be uh, opening uh, a Pandora's box. Yes, come on up. Uh, how much did the new recent immigrants help the, the older generation to, in their sense of the Armenian revival of the sense of identity, if they did at all? Um, how, how well does the uh, new generation help to revitalize the not, old? Not the new generation, but the new, new immigrants. Uh, new immigrants, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, they, they certainly uh, make uh, an Armenian presence very visible, um, but, but they also uh, create uh, some difficulties uh, between uh, the old established immigrants and the new. And that, again, that's not limited to Armenians. It's true overall. Uh, the older immigrants, uh, having been, been acculturated to a degree, you know, the old, I hear from the old, gener my father's generation, my mother's generation, continuously. We never got in trouble. We were never in the court system. Uh, nobody ever, there was never an Armenian in prison. It was, if there was an Armenian in prison, the whole world knew about it. And, then, and you felt that you were the person there because you thought all your neighbors were, knew that that Armenian was there and you identified with that Armenian. And so that was that generation. Uh, they had no choice. They, that was who they were. They were immigrants and they were gonna make it good in a system that didn't give them opportunities for uh, getting off the airplane and going to the welfare office to get uh, uh, a check right away. And so the new, the, the, the new generation, uh, the new generation immigrants, and this is not all of them, uh, it pertains mainly to those from the Soviet Union, but they have learned to use the system in the United States, take advantage of the opportunities, which causes some degree of tension and friction with the older, a uh, proud, so-called proud generation, saying that you know we never, we never did that, uh, we never did that. But, but from the point of view of getting thousands of people to march on April 24th in Hollywood uh, to uh, be visible, uh, certainly that is largely uh, the recent immigrant uh, community or its children. 
Well, I think we've probably come to the end. This has been really exciting and interesting. Thank you very much for your thoughts. Thank you for your uh, uh, Thank help. you all very much, and thanks to the Institute. I'm sure there's still more food and time for chat, so if you care to, please stick around and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Deverell. Thank you, Professor Hovhannessian. I want to add a bit, well, half a comment about Professor Hovhannessian, the book that he held up, written by his grandson, Garin Hovhannessian. I didn't say this at the beginning. I wanted the conversation to go as it did. Professor Hovhannessian's son went on to become foreign minister of Armenia and later to create a political party and to uh, come out as a constructive alternative to government in Armenia. It's part of a path that we didn't get to talk about, but that is in the book that I hope you'll uh, take a look at. I also want to uh, make a commercial based on the word innovation that Professor H just said. On February 21, the Institute will host an all-day event here on campus, Taper Hall Auditoriums and Founders Park, called Innovate Armenia. All-day event, open, free. And we will have global innovators, Alexis Ohanian of Reddit, Rafi Krikorian, Vice President of Twitter, uh, Alex Alexander Seropian, who created the game Halo, which half of this room will not, you know, will mean nothing for, and the other half will jump up and down about. Um, Lara Setagian, who created the new sort of website, News Deeply. Uh, creative NGOs from Armenia, new tech startups, creative music and creative food, innovative, all of them. So we do hope you'll come, February 21. And if you're not on our mailing list, give us your email and you will be. Thank you very much. Thank you.